Thank you for joining us. The following presentation is from a webinar titled, How Do Fraud Risk Assessments Fit in Your Organization? Originally produced on February 19th. The presenters are Certified Fraud Examiner and Principal of Forensic Accounting Services, David Hammerberg, Partner, Janice Snyder, and Senior Manager, Samuel Bowercraft, all of McConley and Asbury. Enjoy the presentation and visit us online at www.macpas.com for in information about our future events and upcoming webinars. Thank you, Tyler. I want to personally thank you for uh, joining us on our webinar this afternoon. My name is David Hammerberg. I'm a principal of uh, Forensic Accounting Services here at m and uh, I've been here a little over 14 years and have been doing forensic examinations for a little over 14 years. My background is in IT as well as accounting. I have various certifications including a CPA, CFE, and various security IT certifications. Um, look forward to this presentation and I will hand it off to Janice. Thanks Dave. My name is Janice Snyder and I'm a partner here at McConley and Asbury. Um, I focus on financial statement and employee benefit plan audits and um, I'm happy that a lot of um, the organizations that I audit, including uh, manufacturing and distribution companies, nonprofit organizations, and healthcare entities, um, are on the webinar today. So I'm looking forward to providing the perspective of the financial statement audit and how fraud ties into that. Thanks. Over to you, Sam. Thank you, Janice. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sam Bowercraft. I'm a senior manager with McConley and Asbury, and I focus primarily on information systems risk management, uh, IT auditing, as well as enterprise risk management. And I work with Dave on uh, several of the past forensic engagements, as well as uh, internal audit and financial audit work. Um, glad to be a part of this group to help share uh, the importance of fraud risk assessments in organizations. And I'll hand it back to Dave. Thank you, Sam. The next slide, webinar objectives, uh, we just wanted to go over quickly what we expect you guys to get out or hope to get out of this presentation. Uh, we've got three points here, understanding the three elements of fraud, uh, what they are, we want to understand um, how they affect the organization, large and small, um, using those elements, how do we prevent fraud, uh, using risk assessments, and again, just the benefits of understanding both the fraud triangle as well as uh, how that fraud triangle interacts and um, and that allows us to do a successful risk assessment preventing fraud. Very good, Dave. And I think we're going to uh, also begin the session with our first poll question, um, just to keep things interactive a bit uh, and get a sense of where the audience is. Uh, what is your experience with fraud? Uh, feel free to take a moment to answer this question um, so we have a sense of uh, what experience you have with fraud within your organization and historically. Uh, Dave, uh, you want to carry on then? We'll uh, see what the responses are here in just a moment. Definitely. Uh, the next slide is a quote that I found, uh, Steve Albright. Um, and it's an interesting slide. And, and to me, it, it means that, you know, people aren't born to be, to steal or to be bad people. Uh, it's a learned activity. Um, and a majority of employees will not... Um, steal right off the, the bat. I mean, it's a learned activity through example, uh, through verbal communication, um, and a person can become delinquent or a fraudster with the right opportunities and the right circumstances. Dave, when I read this slide, I think of the tone at the top of a lot of our organizations, and do you have really strong um, morals and ethics and good values throughout the organization? Because when employees within your organization are looking up at the individuals above them, are they seeing that moral and ethical behavior? Or are small examples, and I, hopefully there's no blatant ones in your organizations, but little tiny examples of, well, leadership doesn't submit their expenses, or leadership has kind of bent this rule. And if there's not a strong tone at the top, it's certainly going to create create these perceived opportunities. I agree. The tone at the top has a, a big um, importance in any organization. And if you really want a fraud-free work zone, um, you really need to start at the tone at the top, and uh, you know that funnels down. So thank you very much. Jumping into the next slide, uh, they, ev I think everyone probably has seen this uh, triangle. It's the iconic fraud triangle. A uh, combination of these three elements uh, produces a, a fraudulent act. Uh, most people um, 
most people have seen this triangle, but they've never really gone through and defined each one of these and then gone into real life examples. So before I jump into this, I think we're going to give the results to the last poll question. Yeah, we have uh, some very common results regarding the poll information. The um, looks like 7% uh, know a little bit about fraud. Some have read, some know a company that experienced fraud. Um, 16% have been in a company that they worked for where they experienced fraud, and apparently 1% are currently stealing from their employer. Um, generally concerning finding, um, but I'm sure <laughs> that's uh, just accidentally clicking on the wrong button. <laughs> but uh, I think one of the things that these poll questions are really meant to highlight is that depending on, on who you are and where your experience lies, you may or may not have had direct experience with fraud. And as we go through these uh, slides, it's important to note that just because you have an experience fraud doesn't necessarily mean that it's out there. And uh, we base our behaviors based on our experience. Um, and as we go through this, hopefully uh, you'll get a stronger sense of the type of risk that fraud may pose for your organization. Sam, I do find it interesting that 43% of the people on the webinar right now have been in an organization that's experienced fraud. I think that's a pretty strong response for that it's been aware of, it's been detected, and individuals have actually seen the ramifications of the fraud. Yeah, absolutely. The iconic fraud triangle. Uh, this triangle and the three elements, pressures, opportunity, rationalization, in my last 14 years of doing fraud examinations, um, every one of those examinations has had parts of these elements. Um, some have been stronger than others, and we'll get into that later. Um, but going into the, the first element, which is pressures. Uh, individual could have internal pressures, external pressures. Internal pressures, obviously, as you can see there, are uh, pressures from management trying to uh, meet analyst forecasts, uh, financial statement pressures, etc. External pressures, now that's where I mostly run into um, the pressures I see in most of my examinations is high personal debt or financial losses. Also see gambling addiction, um, and drug alcohol is also a big one. Uh, so that pressure is one thing that, um, one of the elements that we have no control over. So, um, you know, obviously you can have no control over the personal debt of the individual or medical expenses or any addictions they have. So um, it's really just something to be aware of. Um, in this day and age, we can't really pry too much, but it's something that, you know, if someone's driving around, you know, me living outside their means, et cetera, um, it's something to note, at least from an uh, internal audit or a, you know, from what I do is risk assessments. From, from that point of view, it's something to take note. Yeah, I think it's important to note, Dave, that the, these pressures that people feel um, when they decide to commit fraud are changes in their life that may or may not be observed directly while you're in your working environment. Um, it's easy to forget that people have lives outside of work and that they, you know, things happen to them when they go home. When they come back the next day, that may impact uh, how they're behaving on the job, whether it's uh, a gambling addiction or a health issue. Um, and those changes in behavior um, result in uh, noticeable actions, which leads us to our next question, which is what is the main indicator that shows uh, that fraudulent behavior may be occurring by an employee. And while everyone's answering that question, uh, you can carry on to the next slide. Uh, going back to the pressures, I mean, we oh, have sure. to remember that these are perceived pressures. And when we get into the other element, they'll be perceived as well, opportunity. But for Sam here, a perceived pressure is going to be different for Janice. So someone who has $10,000 worth of credit card debt may act differently than someone else who has $10,000 of credit card debt. So um, again, it's perceived pressure. So we have to realize that people are going to act differently under different circumstances. Um, the next element I wanted to go over is rationalization. This is an element that most people say the only element in the fraud triangle is opportunity that can be changed or that you can regulate or have the opportunity to change so that fraud doesn't occur. Rationalization or integrity, I think you can do a lot when you hire an employee so that you can look into their background, do uh, employment checks, etc. cetera. Um, that's your pretty much only opportunity. Um, once you have the employee hired, um, you have what you have. Um, so. Looking at this rationalization, um, you're going to have people that have very high integrity, 
Um, you know, they have a general trait of, of honesty, um, and they are never going to uh, commit fraud. You know, whatever they do, they could have all the opportunities in the world, the highest pressures, they're not going to commit fraud. Then you've got people that, you know, it seems like the day they are hired, they're going to commit fraud. You know, they did it in their last work, they're doing it in this work. And then where you have most of the people are in the middle. You know, uh, they're mostly good people, but, you know, good people all of a sudden have high pressures and then they see all these opportunities. They see the tone at the top, they see um, lack of internal controls, um, and that leads them to believe, hey, I have um, a perceived opportunity. So that would probably be our, our next element. Absolutely. And it uh, looks like the polling is pretty well done. Um, the, the answer to the question, what is the main indicator that shows an individual may be committing fraud, is actually living beyond one's means, which isn't always noticeable inside the organization, but it uh, usually is the result of fraudulent uh, behavior and misappropriating assets from the company. 34% uh, refusal to take vacations. Um, that is also a high indicator. Um, and many frauds are caught that way when a fraudster has been committing fraud for some time and has never taken a vacation in five years. Um, many, there are many stories about individuals who were suddenly injured or in car accidents and still tried to return to work the next day because they knew that if they missed one day, their fraudulent behavior would be caught. And in some cases it was. Um, but recognizing that there are red flags and behavioral changes in individuals who are committing fraud is a uh, a key point in detecting it you know that's a, a good question because i've never caught a fraudster that i had a huge bank account you know it's always they stole the money to use it for gambling medical expenses um stuff like that so living beyond one's means is again i've never caught a fraudster with a huge bank account um it's just not something that they're you know trying to save um so it's a good question yeah but i think most of the uh, individuals who we've investigated with fraud dave we're living beyond their means. They just weren't saving very well. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yes. You know, yeah. it could be gambling. It could be cars. Um, I'm just saying, you know, they're not driving around in a 10-year-old car putting the money in the bank is what I'm saying. So, I think that's why, Dave, most frauds, uh, you recover nothing. And there's various reasons for that. Either the organization doesn't pursue it um, or, you know, it's not worthwhile or there's nothing to pursue even if you got a conviction. Correct. I think it's under 60 percent or about 60 yeah. percent recover nothing from a fraud yeah I, I think in the frauds i've done it's been a little bit higher but you know people sell their houses they you know it, it's just it's a, it's a mess um and then you know on top of that most of our clients will have insurance that will um help make the company you know whole so um yeah good point james the final element and probably the one we'll spend the most time on is opportunity and perceived opportunity again you know opportunity for me is going to be different than janice etc um and an opportunity is going to be anything that contributes to the perpetrating or concealing of of a um act or that could be fraud um so Dave, I think this slide's interesting because when you're looking at opportunities, as part of the audit, we go through a series of inquiries where we ask um, organizations about the pressures, pressures for fraudulent financial reporting. Uh, but when a lot of people think about fraud, they go right to someone stealing from the organization. And through the audit, we ask about these opportunities where an individual may steal from the organization, may take something from the organization, real cash, wire money out, whether it's credit cards, payables, however that may occur. But during the course of the audit, um, we find things that may be red flags, but it's very, very rare that the audit would actually detect these frauds. Um, I have seen a few, but usually there's already a red flag or something management has identified or something doesn't look right. The AP vendor master was changed or something occurred that it just kind of didn't all add up. But can you comment on the fact of, you know, audits not detecting fraud and what you've seen in your experience and what has caught a lot of those frauds? Yes, I can, Janice. Um, usually, uh, it's a third party that catches the fraud. So, or it could be a hotline. So, a lot of the frauds that I've examined, um, take for instance, it, um, 
as a county taxpayer, the, the actual taxpayers, you know, called up saying, hey, we already paid this, et cetera. And that was a way um, that, you know, red flags for the government, you know, the county. So that's one area. Uh, vendors could call uh, credit card. I've had credit card companies call uh, the company and say, hey, you know, something looks skewed. Um, so it's usually a third party. I think it's 3% are caught by actual audits. So we really cannot rely on a financial audit to catch fraud. Um, so and that's sure. not really the purpose of the financial audit is to catch fraud. That's correct. It is not the direct purpose. There are certain things we have to do in order to detect if fraud may be present, um, but we're not designing our audit specifically with the intent of detecting fraud, um, nor, nor could we. We would be looking at much, more, much larger populations and many more transactions in order to do that. Right. And of course, because part of the nature of fraud, and this slide speaks to it, is not only perpetuating the fraud, but also actively concealing it, seeking to hide it from discovery. And in order to uncover anything, um, you know, when people are trying to hide things, it becomes much more difficult to uncover those things without a great deal of effort. Again, we've got to remember with the perceived opportunity, that is the only element that a client or company can affect and lower the um, possibility of fraud. So... And the, and the way we do that is through increased internal controls, through um, just the, the the awareness that there is oversight, et cetera. Um, so we just got to remember that you know when we're trying to prevent fraud, that is the one element that we've got to concentrate on. And I just you know bringing this all together, we've got the three elements. I wanted to make sure um, you know just kind of give you a couple examples of those three elements. Uh, the first first example I wanted to go through is, um, and these are just examples. Uh, consider uh, student cheats in school. Um, so for the perceived pressure, I need to cheat in school to you know get a scholarship for college. Um, and then for the perceived opportunity, uh, professor you know left the room for the test. So that's my in. You know, that's, you know, the weakness there, the, the teacher should have been there. And then the, uh, the rationalization, everyone cheats a little. So, um, you know, that's bring you know, sort of a silly example, but it brings all three together. And obviously, if the teacher would have stayed there or had someone come in there, that perceived opportunity wouldn't have been there and maybe the, the student wouldn't have, wouldn't have cheated. Because I'm sure he didn't come in there, hopefully, within the mindset that, hey, I'm going to cheat today. He just thought... You know, that teacher left, I see an opportunity, I took it. So we want to remove that opportunity. And a, uh, a, another example, and, and I've had this happen to me, um, and I won't tell you what I did with it, but um, so the, uh, I'll, I'll ask Sam what he does. Um, so someone gives you too much change at the, the grocery store. You've had this happen before, haven't you, Sam? It, it has happened to me. So, you know, the, the perceived pressure is Sam needs the money. The... Uh, the perceived opportunity is they gave it to you. It's sort of their fault. Um, and the rationalization is they'll never miss it. So, you know, it, it's fairly easy to walk away. I mean, for some people, Dave. <laughs> not not for me. Sam would never do that. I, yeah, I would, I would return the change. I should ask Janice. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I would return it, too. <laughs> and I would return it as well. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is this is sort of the, similar to our fraud triangle, um, but it's a, a scale, and I, I kind of like this because um, it it kind of explains you don't need like a fraudster to have heavy elements of each one, heavy pressures, heavy opportunities, have a real heavy you know rationalization or, or very low integrity. Um, you just have to have enough so that that scale tips and they actually commit the fraud. Um, so I kind of like this visual better. I don't know about you, Sam, but uh. yeah, it's an interest. It's a it's a representation of the same situation. I'm a I'm a big fan of spectrums. Sort of each end of the spectrum, whether it's um, high in opportunity or low in opportunity, high in pressure, low in pressure, and those pressures, uh, as I stated before, can change rather quickly. You know, someone can go home and learn that you know from one story that I know. They can go home one night and discover that one of their family members is very ill and needs very expensive surgery. 
and that that pressure changes in a blink of an eye and all of a sudden what they viewed as a low opportunity to commit fraud suddenly becomes something they'll take advantage of because the the situational pressures have gone very high and it's easy to rationalize taking care of a family member um so those things so those the, the scale can can change very rapidly um, and bearing in mind that you have no control over those pressures or the ability to rationalize, uh, focusing on the opportunities is becomes very important. And here we've got the opportunities highlighted. Again, this is the only one, like Sam said, that we can affect. Uh, situational pressures, you know, they could be high. Your personal integrity, again, you could have hired someone that has a very low integrity level. And, but we have to concentrate on keeping those opportunities or perceived opportunities for that employee to be as low as possible. Absolutely, Dave. And, and the, the, the most recent poll question speaks to that. You know, um, we have poor tone at the top, a lack of management review, uh, override of existing controls. Those are all definitely uh, contributors to opportunity within the environment. Uh, but the reality is, is that lack of internal controls is the primary cause and for and the the open door for opportunity within an organization to allow fraud to be perpetrated. That's where the opportunity appears. If if there's an open door, no lock, or there's a door with a lock, but no one ever locks it, that's that's a that's a lack of control. There's an opportunity there that someone might take advantage of. I think of those opportunities when we look at the the financial statement audit. I mean, as I said, we're not detecting fraud, but we certainly want to know if there are opportunities. And the poll question speaks to this as well. 60% of you got this question right, that lack of internal controls is the biggest concern um, and the biggest opening for someone to commit fraud. Um, So as we continue to look at those um, opportunities, we look to, I think, of where are the departments most likely to commit fraud. And there's a lot of studies out on that. And you can get a lot of different information from the departments. But accounting is right at the top of the list, followed by sales operations and senior management. So certainly in the audit, we're focused on accounting as well as senior management in that tone at the top. But it can happen in other departments as well. And we have a, a question here. Um, and I'll read it out loud for you. Before we answer it, do you feel finding fraud is more of a shot in the dark than a skill during a financial exam? And I guess you're, I guess we're thinking of a financial audit here. Well, first I can answer that from a financial audit perspective, okay. and then maybe you can answer it, Dave, from a perspective of a fraud examination. Yep, sounds good. From a financial audit, we're going to be looking at that controls, and I have a lots of comments to organizations about segregation of duties and is it appropriate. And I also work with Sam closely through IT on a lot of our audits, and we're looking at who can access what, and do you have really good restricted access and segregation of duties within um, the IT system to make sure you're not doing inappropriate things there. And are you tracking what's changed in IT? Um, are we going to specifically detect fraud through those? No. We may have what, have recommendations at the end of the audit, some significant, some not so. But all of those could be an indicator that you're leaving a door open. It's not an indicator that something has happened. But I think when you get to a fraud examination, that could be different. Maybe you can comment on that, Dave. Definitely. Um, and I'll comment on two things. I, a fraud examination and then doing a, a risk assessment. Um, and I think for a fraud examination, usually a fraud examination starts obviously uh, most of the time from a third party making the client aware that, hey, you have an issue. Uh, then that client will call us or non-client will call us and we'll go in there and we have a, you know, you know, sometimes it's just, hey, something is wrong in this area or, some, you know, it could be just that vague. And we'll go in and we'll really do a detailed of every transaction. We'll do a review and look at it. So um, I wouldn't say it's a shot in the dark. We're doing a pretty uh, logical review of the that area. And unlike an audit, we're looking just at that area. So it could be payables, could be inventory. Um, and it's uh, it's thorough, and I, I I wouldn't say it's a shot in the dark. Yeah, and I think I think that the the during the financial audit, uh, as I understand it, um, there there is a review of processes and how how those processes may or may not be effective in supporting the reporting of financials. Is that correct, Janice? 
Yes, that okay. is correct. We are required to understand certain processes as well right. as understand the IT environment. But understanding the processes is not the same as testing those processes. And the financial audit isn't designed to test all the processes to the extent that would normally sort of uh, call out areas where fraudulent behavior is occurring. So, so part of the financial audit speaks to the procedures that may identify where fraud may occur or there may be areas for improvement within the control environment, but it won't always test those things out. Yeah, and I had a good example come to mind on that, Sam. I was doing an audit of a, a very large public company, and we had an individual um, within IT that was part of the treasury cycle that, that completely detailed, spelled out how I can create ghost IDs, give them access, wire money out, and do all this stuff. And at the end, I said, I, I think they just told me how they can steal $10 million on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, be out of the country, and it'll get caught, but it won't get caught till Monday. So as an auditor, I'm going, wow, I have to tell someone about this. But from a financial statement audit perspective, at the end of the year, if they were out $10 million and it was stolen and we pr appropriately recorded that in the financial statements and they detected it after the fact, um, you know, that was still, you know, you could have a clean audit opinion on that, even though the organization was defrauded $10 million. So clean audit opinion doesn't always mean happy management. It means the financial mm -hmm. statements are accurate, oh, or materially good. accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Janice. And I mentioned risk assessments. I think, uh, you know, risk assessments, and we'll get more into risk assessments in the, in the coming slides, but it's mostly used for prevention, but it can be a detection. Um, we have found fraud um, doing risk assessments, um, looking at opportunities, um, and actually discovering fraud. So um, depending on what sort of risk assessment we do, which modules we pick, et cetera. Knowledge is power. Uh, now that we understand the three elements of the fraud triangle and hopefully um, understand that opportunity is the, th the thing that we have to concentrate on the lowering the perceived opportunities, um, we can use risk assessments to um, identify those opportunities. What you know, obviously, each employee is going to have perce different perceived opportunities, and with a skilled eye and someone who um, is able, you know, has seen fraud before, um, we're able to um, identify those and help correct those. Yeah, and, and with that in mind, risk assessments are really meant to be a preventative tool. Um, the The purpose of the risk assessment is to look at an environment and and really say, well, what risks does any environment face? Um, I'm, I'm big on stories. Uh, I've said this before, and uh, in preparation for this presentation, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, which is attributed to Mr. Benjamin Franklin. And I did a little bit of research on this, and I found the story behind it rather interesting, because I always thought it had to do with uh, health. You know, if you, uh, if you take care of yourself, that bit of prevention will be worth uh, its weight in a, p a pound of cure, right? It's, a, it's easier to prevent uh, an illness than uh, deal with it after the fact. It actually has nothing to do with health. Um, it actually has to do with the fact that in the 1700s, people used to carry uh, fire from one room to another, usually with a shovel, hence that high-quality shovel there. And uh, there was an opportunity for them to buy a special shovel that had a lid that would keep the coals and embers inside of it while they were carrying it around their house. But, of course, that was a little more expensive and uh, so people would just use a shovel because they were easy to obtain and, uh, you know, easy to use. The uh, challenge there is, as they're carrying it around their house, the, uh, they would carry it up and down the steps and room to room, and these coals and embers would fall out of the shovel and fall into cracks in their homes. Um, homes in the 1700s weren't quite as uh, neatly fitted as our houses today. Uh, well, those coals would sit overnight, and uh, sometime in the wee hours of the morning, uh, their house would catch fire, and the uh, the reality is is uh, Benjamin Franklin actually spoke to this, and he said, you know, the fire may fall in to the chinks and make no appearance until midnight when your stairs being in flames, you may be forced, as Benjamin Franklin once was, to leap out your window, um, and then uh, as as a result, the place is crowded by active men of different ages, professions, and titles who, with one mind apply themselves with all vigilance and resolution 
to the hard work of conquering the increasing fire. So one small mistake, one uh, lapse in judgment, or one small opportunity, it starts out as a small coal, but it can quickly become a raging fire, which becomes an issue for everyone uh, very quickly. And uh, Benjamin Franklin said, for the unfortunate few whom for the unfortunate few for whom the hands of chance all line up, disaster is the outcome. And I think it really sort of puts this phrase into context. The, you know, this ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. No one wants to have all hands on desk, deck beating down this fire that they knew they could have prevented in the past. And we're going to speak a little bit about the, uh, the impact of, of fraud on an organization uh, shortly. But I thought that adding some context to this concept of prevention versus cure was is very important to note. Yeah, I, I think what I take away from that story, Sam, is a shovel's a whole lot cheaper than a house. So, you know, prevention is a whole <laughs> lot cheaper than an examination. Is that what we're trying to say here? Yes, I think I think you summed that up much faster than my story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll just uh, s- stay what I got out of it. Well, that makes me think, Dave, what is the... the well, I, I think we have a poll question on that, so I think maybe we can move to that question. But yeah. I'll wait a moment till we go to the poll question. I was getting ahead of myself. Uh, I think, we, yeah, we can pull that up. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Next. Uh, and the next slide here, um, just want to, before I get into it, each one of these columns stands on its own, so the rows don't go cross and correlation. But jumping in, these are examples of fraud elements from actual fraud cases that I've done. Not, um, it's not conclusive, but it, it gives examples of the different pressures. So, and pressures, rationalization, and perceived opportunities. So the pressures um, that I've seen, gambling debts, alcohol, uh, medical bills, credit card debt, living beyond your means, um, all of them I've seen. And um, in all cases, um, You know, I was going to say in all cases it's a sad story, but um, it is. I mean, and I've seen, you know, it could be 30-year-olds, could be 70-year-olds. I've had um, all, th- all gamuts, I've, you know, I've seen. So those are the pressures. Jumping in to the rationalization. The rationalizations I have seen, um, and you can see them there, um, I'll pay it back for the better good. Um, I won't get caught. Uh, you know, tone at the top is bad. Uh, I'll take less than the other employee. I deserve it. Um, some of those, you know, I've seen all of them, um, and they all seem to make sense to the employee that is stealing the money. Um, looking back, they're sorry, but at the time, they, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a rationalization that they can live with. Perceived opportunities that I've seen. Uh, you know, the employee, and again, perceived opportunities are, are really perceived opportunities of that employee. Um, everyone on this webinar is going to have different perceived opportunities. Some people, and they're perceived. Maybe they're not really an opportunity, but they see it as an opportunity. Uh, no oversight. Uh, no one knows what I do. Uh, lack of internal controls. You know, and perceived opportunities. You know, some of those could be, most of these are, are internal controls, but, you know, some of those could be opportunities the employee makes. You know, so the employee goes in and learns the accounting system that no one else knows how to do and develops an opportunity for themselves. So I've seen that as well. So, um, again, we've got we've to work to lower those perceived opportunities. Dave, and I know with these perceived opportunities, as you look at that, this list, the, the top three reasons that a lot of the frauds have occurred in a lot of the studies I've read is that first one, the lack of internal control, so as we mentioned earlier in the poll question, but the second one is no oversight or lack of review of those processes. So if management tells me as an auditor they're doing certain things, then you know we, we try to rely on that and don't always test those controls, but it's important that management is verifying that those controls occur. And the one, I hold the keys to the kingdom, uh, in the financial statement audit world, we call that management override. Can someone circumvent processes and procedures um, or or is there a perception they're not being watched or monitored Um, and so they would be the top three reasons that that a lot of the frauds occur yeah I mean I I find a lot of frauds 
occur because of that trusted person. You know, it could be the family member, um, and they're just trusted. And, and like you said, there's no oversight. Um, and the, the other thing that you mentioned with the keys to the kingdom, I find that a lot in nonprofits, um, that th it's more, you know, they're, they're on a shoestring budget, you know, so there's a little bit more um, issue with um, – people having more controls, less segregation of duties, stuff like that. I might say shoestring budget is they're trying to be good fiduciaries of the monies they've been given and good stewards of that. Correct. And they're trying to do that with, this, in some cases, as few resources as possible. They just want to make sure they still have the controls in place. And that's true at any organization. Correct, correct. Right, and uh, just to follow up on the poll question where we asked what the average amount is lost uh, for nonprofits, um, and it is higher for pro for for profit organizations. Um, it looks like there's sort of a an even feeling across the seventy five hundred and two hundred thousand dollar range. The average for nonprofits in the two thousand twelve uh, fraud report was actually one hundred thousand dollars for nonprofits. So by the time a fraud was discovered, that one individual, just one person, had uh, misappropriated about a hundred thousand dollars, and it goes up for. Uh, for-profit organizations from there. And that's just one individual over the course of them committing fraud. So, yeah. so Dave, you're right. It, a house is more expensive than a shovel. Mm -hmm. Got that right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would just add to that. I, I read that same 2012 report as well, Sam. And I found it interesting that certainly for-profits are higher, closer to 145 or 150,000 per, per incident. Um, but healthcare organizations were the highest at 175,000 on average per fraud. And I think with our experience here at m a examining frauds, those are, you know, our numbers are, are usually higher than those averages. So just something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. That's really unfortunate, but they're also going to the extent of hiring someone and getting assistance and trying to prove that and recover from their insurance company. So Correct. I think it makes a lot of sense that the frauds we see are higher. Correct. Yeah. Real life examples. Now these uh, these columns, the rows do correlate. So um, just some examples of, of ones that I've have examined. Um, county government um, done golf courses, done local governments, uh, corporate um, religious organizations. The perceived pressures. Um, I'll jump onto that one. And why don't you just put all four of them on there? So county government, you know, the perceived pressure for this person was the gambling debt and medical bills. So they had two things going on. And the rationalization that I could come up with was they will never know, no one was really getting hurt, and I can use the money. Um, and the perceived opportunity was the lack of, lack of c internal controls, uh, revenue tracking. Um, and a lot of these frauds, if the individual, you know, most frauds will start out small and get large. And if they stay in that medium zone, it's very hard to catch. So all of these, I would say all the ones that I'm giving real life examples here have escalated. And when they escalated, that's when things fell apart. You know, people can't um, keep two sets of books forever and not make a mistake. The second real life example there, uh, a golf course, um, and that person was living beyond their means. Um, I deserve it. I earned it was rationalization. And that, that one had also little oversight and internal controls was um, was not there. Um, another one, um, and we don't have to go through every one. You, you can read um, the ones there, but uh, we'll drop to the bottom of the religious organizations. Um, and these are the hardest ones, I think, to do just because a lot of times people are, the fraudster here is using that money almost for a good purpose, but it's not their money to use. Um, I've seen um, individuals uh, use that money not for their benefit, but for family members, um, for, um, you know, j just local disasters. So um, they're hard, but, you know, there's a black and white line and, um, those individuals crossed it, and um, it's sort of sad. Well, and I think it's important to note uh, with nonprofits and religious organizations, frequently there's a very specific culture that's associated with nonprofits, and uh, you know uh, there's a there's a social mission, there's a purpose, there's a there's a willingness and desire to do good in the community, um, and of course the type of people who are normally associated with that kind of work are are good people. They're they have good intentions and they are sincere. 
Um, and there's a great deal of trust placed in those organizations because uh, they are they're very uh, well run and they have to be pretty efficient given the manner by which they operate. So there's a lot of trust and there may be less verification. As a result, you see $100,000 uh, over the course of a fraud for a nonprofit. And that that's even for very small organizations. Um, my brother-in-law was a member of a hunting club and they had a fraud many years ago and it was $70,000 by the time it was caught by the treasurer's wife. Uh, very sad, but high level of trust, not a lot of oversight and a very disappointing outcome for everyone because of course that impacts not only the organization but just a relationship with your spouse even. Risk assessments and I want to jump into them. You have a definition here, preventive and detective measure. I uh, mentioned that before. Um, risk assessments and, and the way we do risk assessments, we start out with a, a sort of a 15 module um, risk assessment and we'll we usually never do all the modules, but we'll sit down with the client and go over, you know, what are the soft areas? What areas do you feel that, you know, are the weakest internal controls? Um, and we start off with those first. Uh, we may start with those and then we move, move to another section, you know, next quarter, next year, et cetera. Um, but again, it's a, it's a roadmap to show you where those perceived opportunities may, may lie. And it's, it's often, um, a lot of people just think it's a checklist, but it's more than that. It's more of a um, educated, um, you know, after doing uh, fraud examinations for 14 years, you kind of start to think of a f like a fraudster mm -hmm. and you kind of think, how can I steal that money? And you're able to look at that organization and, and, and figure that out as opposed to, you know, uh, someone, you know, in, and not just an honest person off the street going through, you know, they might not perceive that just because their, you know, their integrity is higher, so if well, that makes sense. I think it has to do with integrity. I think it also has to do with experience and knowledge of how different industries and businesses operate and what it means when processes operate effectively, but also where opportunities within a process may break down for opportunity to exist, for fraud to occur. Um, you know, I, I, I was doing IT consulting and engineering work before I moved into the audit realm. And uh, over the past 10 years working within business and focusing on process re-engineering and controls, I've certainly learned a great deal um, through these experiences and through the work that I performed. Um, and it's not necessarily that it can't be learned, but it, it does take experience and you have to lay your hands on it and, and really dig into it. And it's just like anything, you, you can develop expertise in a lot of areas. I don't do financial audits because that's Janice's job. And I don't think... It's a good thing, Sam. Thank you, Janice. I think everyone would agree to that. Um, and it's uh, having that experience and, and perspective, I think, is key to helping to identify those things. That being said, I, I think, we, you know, doing a internal fraud risk assessment is going to help. Um, but, you, you know, long term, you may want to um, look at other avenues um, and go from there. Cus customized risk assessment development. Um, again, you know, we've mentioned this over and over again. And you've probably, you know, I'll probably get a comment on the thing. All you said today was opportunities, opportunities. Well, it's the opportunities that we can control. And if you get that when you leave this webinar, you know, I, I succeeded. Um, and we want to identify those opportunities that Sam sees as a way of uh, financially benefiting him the way Janice sees. Um, and we don't want to, you know, when we go into a risk assessment, we're not like, hey, Sam, we think he's going to steal money. We're thinking, you know, what is the opportunities he could see? You know, we're not judging integrity. We're just seeing perceived opportunities. Um, so again, there's a customized module or checklist that just not a checklist, but it's uh, something that we start off with and then we customize it for each client. Um, so Dave, when you say modular checklist, I'm used to being on the financial statement side, and we talk about cycles, procure to pay, you know, how would money leave the organization or the revenue cycle or the cash receipt cycle? How does this relate to those? And are there any similarities between the modular checklist and what I know as cycles? When I when I'm talking about modules, I'm talking about, you know, say we just look at employees module, or we're looking at investment module, um, you know, just different areas of the accounting system. Um, and we break it down and, you know, we do risk assessments based on that. 
And one thing with these risk assessments, size and complexity of the company is a huge issue. So not a huge issue, but it's a um, something that we have to understand. So for a small company or a small nonprofit, we may be able to do a risk assessment for that whole company and do it fairly, um, you know, quickly and within a, a, a you know a normal budget. For a large public company or whatnot, it's going to be more of a modular breakout because there's no way you could do all of it at one point in time. But also, I mean, for the modular approach, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, um, usually focuses on higher risk areas as well within the organization. Correct. You're meeting with the client ahead of time. You're not going in saying, hey, um, you need this done now. No, we're going to meet with the client and obviously they're going to have some idea of where their weaknesses are. So... Um, that, that's how we, we start off. Fraud risk assessment. Um, we got one through seven here um, of, of what it you know what happens in a fraud risk assessment. Identify potential inherent fraud risks. Um, you know evaluating people is a big thing. You know again opportunities. What are the employees' opportunities? We want to evaluate 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 people and understand them. Thanks for helping me out there, Sam. You're welcome. Um, so, jumping through there, you can read that, but I think we've, we've hit most of, those, most of those points. Yeah, and I think one of the key things and follow-ups from a fraud risk assessment is right there at the end, which is, um, you know, number six is identifying and evaluating residual fraud risks, and then number seven is, is responding to them in some way. Now, a response can vary um, if you discover that your bank vault is always left unlocked overnight and no one locks the front door. You know, you're going to take quick action to do that, to do something about that. Whereas if uh, the fraud risk is a little bit lower, you may say, well, we don't really have the time or resources or concern in that area to address it. But by having performed the risk assessment, at least you'll have awareness of it. And you can follow up on it again in the future and say, well, has anything changed in the organization um, over the past year or six months or whatever it may be that makes this risk higher? Um, but the, the key the key result of most fraud risk assessments, the, the first benefit is visibility and awareness within the organization. Um, because if you don't know about it, you can't do anything about it. That's, that's a great point, Sam. Um, responding to that risk assessment is a huge, um, huge thing to risk. Do just doing the risk assessment is great, but not responding to the items found um, is is not good. Right. And and I think it's important to note that the, the response can be a choice to not take action. Correct. But but you still should make that conscious choice. You know, a lot of times we'll find a risk uh, risk that we say, hey, you know, there's an opportunity here and someone will come and say, hey, that's our culture our, and that's what the way we do it. Um, but it's, it's better to know that that opportunity exists. You know, if I know that carrying those coals in that shovel may cause a fire, I'm going to be a little bit more careful. I may check and say, hey, you know, look back over the floor after I did it. Um, so just knowing it. And then, you know, if there is it, something that happens, I feel better if I knew it beforehand um, than to be a total surprise. Yep. And I think knowing it beforehand is helpful. I saw one instance of an organization where we came in to do the audit and they weren't able to reconcile cash for several months. It actually turned out that cash was off about $2 million and they were able to clean it up. And But ultimately, they never found $900,000 and they never identified that was a risk. But I mean, the CFO was asking every month, are the bank wrecks done? And the answer was yes. Um, and that was not a truthful answer. So there were a lot of factors playing in there and processes were in place. They just weren't being followed. Um, so I think it would have helped them to identify that inherent risk over the cash as step one. And then you could move through other aspects of a fraud risk assessment in a situation like that. You know, a useful risk assessment, you know, what does it take to be uh, successful at that? And I think what it really comes down to is you need um, buy-in from the employees and management. You know, the tone at the top has to be, hey, this is going to benefit us all, and um, we need that interaction. Just to look at the books is not going to be a successful risk assessment. We need interaction. Um, we need to know how things work, just not how it is on paper, how things work. Yeah, and it's key. I mean, interaction and participation. Um, a great deal of the information uh, that we gather from these types of processes uh, comes from people who are on the ground and, and doing the job from day to day. They know the ins and outs, and their subject matter expertise is beneficial. 
you know, at, at the end of the risk assessment, you know, wh what are the next steps? And we've talked about these a little bit already, um, mm -hmm. but the next step is to mitigate those risks. You know, how do we mitigate them? And, you know, if we don't mitigate them, at least, you know, they're there. And then as well as um, how beyond just mitigating those do you reduce the opportunity that the employee sees? And I think jumping into the, the, to the next slide there is – Customized fraud, customized fraud prevention training. I've done a lot of fraud training, um, just like fraud 101 training, and it's uh, you know it's worthwhile, etc. But when you do a customized risk assessment and you can see the opportunities, and then you do a customized fraud prevention training, you really um, can focus and lower that opportunity that those employees or everyone sees. Yeah, and I think that that type of training helps to demonstrate that there's a clear tone at the top with regard to fraud, which is, you know, one of the key aspects of fraud prevention is a clear tone at the top, which is zero tolerance. If, if you commit fraud, then there will be a follow-up. And that's important to set that in policy. It's important to communicate it, and training helps to communicate that to all the employees as well. Agreed. You know, conclusion here, um, fraud is a risk, um, and fraud risk assessments will be, uh, you know, will, you know, it won't prevent all fraud, but it's going to take a, a giant step in preventing a lot of frauds. Um, and it's going to be a whole lot cheaper um, than a fraud exam examination. You know, a like fraud examination, you know, could span two years. Um, it, it's a long, drawn-out process with detectives, insurance companies, subpoenas. Um, and a fraud prevention is just a nice um, tool to use so that you don't have to go through that. And uh, have you ever had any clients who had a fraud investigation who said they enjoyed the experience, Dave? Uh, I have not had any of those. Um, I remember mm -hmm. in the beginning of my career, um, I used to uh, ask for, um, you know, clients to give me a little bit of a, you know, a snippet of how I did, you know, so I could use it on marketing brochures. But I found out very quickly that no one wanted to give me a little bit of a... Um, they didn't want to give you an endorsement to yeah, acknowledge yeah, the organization that, had right. fraud. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, people don't want to say, hey, yeah, Dave did a great job at my company finding the fraud. Um, but no one enjoys it. No one wants to see their name in the papers. Um, it's just a, a bad situation. And a lot of people, they don't even go to authorities, um, insurance companies, uh, just because they don't want their name in the paper. So um, it's just a, it's a miserable time. Um, I think there's a very time. real reputational risk there, uh, and organizations have to weigh that and agreed. the cost benefits once a fraud does occur. Well, and I, and I think that uh, the the poll question that we had just before this one, which was uh, how long, uh, what's the average amount of time that it goes that passes before a fraudster is normally caught? The answer to that question was actually 18 months. Um, and if you think about it, you know, organizations are usually very surprised when a fraud occurs because. It, it was a surprise to them. Uh, you know, obviously they weren't expecting it. But if you think about this 18-month answer, um, that means that someone you trusted and worked with for 18 months, on average, has has been betraying your trust. And in our experience, or in my experience with the fraud cases we've investigated, uh, the amounts are are you know, no one wants to lose 100 or 150 thousand dollars from the organization that they may or may not recover. But invariably, it impacts the culture immensely. Um, how, how the betrayal of trust has impacted uh, the working relationships within the organization, um, it's, it's, uh, it's significant. Um, and, it's not, and then so you have this betrayal of trust, you have a loss of resources, and then you have this reputational impact, and um, it, uh, it's unpleasant. It's, it, and avoiding it is by far, far preferable than, than having to go through the, the process of an investigation um, and possible prosecution of someone who you used to trust. I agree. I agree. We have one question that just popped up, uh, and I'll read it out loud here. I've had companies being concerned that training with training will teach their employees how to steal. Have you had this situation, and what do you suggest to say? You know, um, I would say that the the training lowers the perceived opportunity for the the employee, and the that 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 employees already going to have those opportunities. So in my experience, it's shown that the the you know the employer is on top of things, and it shows 
um, that those opportunities are less. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that fraud prevention training is a bit of a misnomer because it, it, it sounds like you're well, and you are you're you're doing fraud prevention training. You're training people on how to prevent fraud, how to detect fraud, how to communicate if they identify fraud. And you're also communicating the tone at the top. Fraud is not acceptable. And what you're not doing is you're saying, well, you know, if you did want to steal stuff out of the warehouse, here's what you would want to do. So it's it's not quite as detailed as that. Um, but it is important to note that you know we we talk about and communicate things that are important to us. So if an organization is getting everyone together and saying, "Hey, listen, let's talk about fraud prevention," then the organization is essentially supporting fraud prevention within the organization. And also, it's very important to communicate the the consequences of fraud. You know, the zero tolerance policy is key, and communicating that is key. And I think um, you got to realize a lot of times we do these risk assessments and we'll do different training for different, you know, for managers, for staff, et cetera. So um, that enables us to uh, be a little bit more careful in what we say. And a lot of times these risks that come out of the risk assessment, um, they'll go to management and they'll see the exact risks, but our actual training will be on the, you know, um, mitigating factors. So they don't necessarily know how to steal or what the actual risk is, but they know the uh, mitigating factor that's in control. So um, that mitigating factor is for that item, but they don't necessarily know it's for that, you know, it's taking money out of the cash register. We have a camera. They just know there's cameras there, you know. Um, so. Very good. Let's, uh, we're going to pass it back to uh, Tyler here for just one moment, and then we'll uh, handle any uh, additional questions that we have. Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar, How Do Fraud Risk Assessments Fit in Your Organization? Brought to you by McConley and Asbury. We will be sticking around to answer some of the questions that have come in, so please continue to submit them via the chat function. As a reminder, you will be receiving CPE credit for attending this one-hour webinar. CPE certifications will be sent out via email within the next 15 days. Also, you will be receiving a follow-up email to this webinar with a link to a short survey about the webinar, and we would appreciate your feedback. We will be posting a copy of today's presentation on our website at www.macpas.com news. Look for that post to be up in the next few days. Join us for our next webinar on March 26th titled Recruiting Top Talent in 2015. This webinar will be hosted by McConley and Asbury partner and Chief Operating Officer Greg Lowe and Human Resource Coordinator Holly Kressler. This webinar will highlight current trends within mid to upper level management positions across the country. This webinar will cover the best practices utilized today for locating and successfully recruiting new talent, the steps that need to be taken to increase the probability of a long-term fit and match, and the pros and cons to outside recruiting. We would be happy to have you join us for this free webinar on March 26th. Now, let's go back to Dave, Janice, and Sam to answer the questions that have been submitted. You know, one of the questions that we got is, is technology making fraud easier or harder to commit? And I would answer yes. <laughs> and I would answer maybe. You know, it, it, it's it's getting harder. It's making it easier to commit, and it's also making it easier to find. So um, I think if the employer is using the tools wisely, um, I think um, the technology is helping um, to combat fraud more than an employer, employee can use to commit fraud. But the employer has to be using those tools, um, cameras, um, and all that stuff would come out of a risk assessment. But, you know, if an employer is just saying, hey, it's not going to happen to me, I, I think technology is going to hurt them. You know, they can easily make uh, checks. They can cop, you know, duplicate stuff, et cetera. So um, the answer to that question, I, I, I find, is yes. And uh, that, I think, an answers all of the questions we have to date. And if there aren't any, we're going to wrap up here. I uh, just want to remind you that uh, we have the benefits. Um, you know, the benefit, you know, the risk assessment benefit is to, to eliminate the opportunities. So, again, I appreciate you coming to the uh, webinar, and thank you very much.
Yeah, and just as a reminder, um, if you have any questions, or we also have a fraud prevention checklist that's available from the uh, 2012 uh, fraud report, uh, feel free to email Dave. Uh, he loves getting emails and answering lots of questions. Um, and if you have any other uh, concerns, uh, please reach out to him. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you once again for joining us for this presentation, produced by McConley and Asbury, Certified Public Accountants. We hope you join us and participate in our upcoming events. You can stay up to date with news and learn more about our recent events by visiting us at www.macpas.com. Thanks again, and have a great day.